All right, let's move on to yeah. our second video where we're going to talk about mechanic differences, and we're going to start with Malachi. Mm -hmm. So how do you compare the complexity of rules between TSR editions and WotC edition of Dungeons & Dragons? Rules-wise, I feel that um, definitely TSR was more of a simple. They were, in my opinion, more easy, were easier to follow. There's more room there for the GM or DM to make house rules to make judgment calls when they arose. Once Watsy took over with third edition, that's when you got the the, the rule for everything. <laughs> you know, you need oh, you want to be able to wipe your butt. You need there's a feat for that. You better have the feet. Yeah, look or it up. You're not going to be good enough to do it. Yep. You know, we got to feet bloat. We had, I mean, the the gap for the linear fighter quadratic wizard was so wide at that point that everybody was playing wizards because that was like the best class. And then you get to 4E and it gets to the shift of the same. Everything's the same. Everybody's the same. It's daily powers at will powers, but it's all the same. It's just different flavor. And now we're at everybody's got magic. Everybody's literally the same. <laughs> yeah. Everybody's just now a magic user and said just the same rules for every all your abilities and stuff. So what are some specific mechanics introduced by Watsi? That's right. I'm going to make you talk nice about Watsi. Oh. That you think improved the gameplay and why do you find them significant? You're going to hate me for this. Okay. I agree with Mr. Welch. He had a recent video on what he would do to fix the current edition of D&D. I honestly, I agree with him. I think the three saves are the best thing that Watsi did. Fortitude, Reflex, and Will. It's easy to figure out what to use. You don't have a bad save. That, like, 5e's big problem with saves is you get what, one, two saves. One's a good save, one's a one you hardly use. I thought it was one per attribute. But the thing is, it's your proficiency bonus that gets added to your save if you're proficient in it. If you're not proficient in it, all you ever add is your attribute bonus. Saves were, I think, with the Watsi era, they did saves the best in 3E. Uh, agree to disagree and kick you off the show soon. All right, Bear. Bye. <laughs> uh, how how do you compare the complexity of rules between TSR's edition and Watsi's editions of Dungeons and Dragons? <laughs> See, you know that thing I like to say about D and D Baby's first role playing game. Mm -hmm. uh, Watsi gave you the pacifier to go with it, which was quite <laughs> nice. Okay. So what do you what do you mean by? I mean, I get what you say, but what do you mean by that in terms of uh, actual game mechanics or system design? So, uh, so everybody likes to go on about how complex and in-depth third edition D20 was amazing. No, go read your first one. Go, go watch Mage's Musing's short video on explaining spell casting and ACs and stuff and how that whole plays out. It's it, AD and D is an exceptionally complicated game, but in some weird way, it made sense. Mm -hmm. So you could follow it. Though we all know most people dropped a lot of rules when they played AD and D, either first or second edition. They they cherry picked the rules they were going to use at their table. It's just the way it was. Watsi D and D is so streamlined, so universal, so everything's the same, everything follows the flow, everything is on the chart, everything is the uh. thing, the thing, the thing. And all that matters ultimately at the end of the day, other than your stupid damage dice is that everything can be resolved with this this is the holy the holy die that will resolve all your issues don't worry about percentile dice don't need them and it was sad because it became homogenized and boring and bland mm -hmm. uh, and we have seen that progression continue throughout the entire design philosophy of the brand ever since yes i'm probably the only person on the panel who doesn't hate 4e uh, but at the same time, it's still a D20 mechanic at the end of the day. Everything about the magical D20, which is boring. I miss... Boring, yes, yes, yes. Percentile yes. chances for things. I miss 
Why does the D12 exist? Well, let's find a reason. Well, AD&D had somewhere in there a reason for a D12 to exist. Thief mechan- I think one of the editions had that for like the thief mechanics. Whatever it was. Ooh, TSR's D&D D&D was more complex, but more exciting to play. Third edition, fourth edition, fifth edition, very simplistic, very straightforward. <laughs> And oh so bland. Though I do still say 5th edition has a nice core engine in it. It just needs some tweaking and less magic. Uh, but there is a good engine in there. Okay. That's what I think. I'm going to skip you for follow-up question because... Uh, hey. I, yeah, you're welcome. And I'm going to jump on down to Harmony here. Uh, how do you compare the complexity of rules between TSR's editions and Watsi's editions of Dungeons & Dragons? It's an interesting question because TSR, I think, um, AD and D especially, is fairly complex on the uh, on the world generation level. Like they have fairly complex rules for generating dungeons. Um, for example, the number of third level enemies appearing on a first level dungeon, and vice versa. There, there are formulas for that, kind of. Um, so, I mean, I think the rules on that level can be fairly complex. However, on the individual character level, it's simpler and newer in older editions than in newer editions. And I believe the reason for that is in older editions, you are expected to eventually have a brigade or um, retainers or be able to control more than just your own character because you are working towards a domain level play. Whereas in newer editions, it's expected that instead of working towards a domain level play, your character is more complex and going to increase in complexity as you go along rather than uh, stay fairly stagnant in complexity with maybe a couple things added later on. Um, so I believe that's the reason for it. But I, I do think on a character level, old editions are simpler, um, but on a, but, but on a DM's level, it's uh, it's, it's a bit more complex than that. What is a specific mechanic that you can think of, or subsystem, doesn't have to be a direct mechanic or subsystem, mm-hmm. that you that TSR introduced that you think was either innovative or certainly better than what WotC has done? Um, I'm going to go with the random generation. The Appendix C in the AD&D DMG is a better random generator. It's a better encounter generator than anything that has ever come out by uh, WotC. Um, if you look at the uh, encounter tables for WotC, it's mostly like a D20 or a D12 table. Uh, and there's like one little D20 table for grasslands, one for hills, one for jungles. And it's like 20 encounters. Um, this is in the, uh, I believe this is in the DMG. It might be in Xanathar's though. I can't remember exactly which. But in ad d they have the entirety of Appendix C, which is huge. Like there are like D100 tables. There are like multiple per page. Um, they're, they're huge and they're complex and they have sub tables. And um, I, I think that was simplified a lot in a translation. I just beat my desk. I was excited. Um, <laughs> there goes another soul. Simplified a lot in, in, in a translation for, for sure. My favorite edition of D&D is second edition, and I have to say that even there, at least at first, it kind of dumbed down some of the tables. Instead of percentile rolls, there's a lot of D20 rolls. It it picked it up in the end, but uh, go ahead, Malachi. The the big failing of the 2E D&D and Monster Manual is the fact that there were no random monster tables. Yes, there were. You made your own. No. Oh, I'm sorry. Because I used the real stuff, the compendiums. There literally were in the compendiums. Well, okay, yeah. because once you had be that... a man, get the compendiums. <laughs> I was too late. The compendium was gone by the time I got into it. No, the uh, what was it? The uh, annual, the monstrous annual one, had all your random tables in it for monsters. Okay. Uh, so, uh, let's see here. So, da, 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 what did I say? Uh, so, I got a couple of notes here. I was kind of surprised that uh, nobody directly said this, but uh, well, I think one of the biggest changes was that Watsi got rid of a lot of the subsystems. Now, Baird did touch on that when he said that D20 was just, it is boring. Yes, I get that. But specifically, there were, again, thief subsystems, a strength subsystem. <laughs> There's like, like all these different little nuances that, sure, I think Harmony was using the word, you know, complicated. I kind of don't like that word only because that automatic seat was complicated. That's why people didn't like it. No, it, there, there, it wasn't complicated. There is a heart and a soul to it. Was it the most efficient way of doing things? No, 
<laughs> but that's also what gave it its flavor. And I think all three of these guys knocked it out when, you know, when they're basically talking about how it's boring, it's just kind of like, eh, it's just, you know, you know, you don't, ha you don't have that interest. You, you know, the random tables. Now it's just pre-programmed challenge rating, uh, which doesn't work right. That's well, I, I, and anybody can break it. Yeah. Go ahead, Harmony. That's a really good point, actually, because there were a bunch of like subsystems that we don't really have anymore that have been homogenized. Like somebody was showing me recently the uh, unarmed combat system in AD&D, <laughs> and I'm like, oh, yeah. because in later editions, it's just um, you just, just roll the hits. It's really the same. Like, with oh, wow. let's be honest, those tables were funny. I mean, if you actually used them, you're like, okay, this is ridiculous, but it was fun. Go ahead, Bear. Yeah. So this is this is a problem in game design in general. Is that basically, basically, I lose the argument because I said basically. Uh, essentially, what happened was uh, D twenty dumbed the audience down to a point where everything was so streamlined mm -hmm. and everything interconnected. And don't tug on that; you never know what it's connected to. Yep. That now, when you do game design, you say, "Well, I'm going to have this, or I'm going to have that." Oh, that's really complicated. Yep. Yeah, I know. Yep. Basic math is hard, kids. I get it. Addition and subtraction. That's the devil. Right Bear, Bear, I, I, I have to jump in because, you know, I'm making my game right. And I talked to people a few months ago that I'm going to have the uh, tables that people can reference. I, yep. I have to reference tables? I have to read? Well, yeah. Yeah, well, yeah you have to reference a table. What <laughs> the hell? Nobody wants to reference a table. Why can't I just make a decision? Well, theoretically, you can, but you know, uh, the table is going to make it a lot easier for you. I'm just saying. But yeah, you know, you're you're right. People want to have this weird. I glance at the book for five minutes and I have it memorized. Sort of system. Yeah, the first time I encountered active defense was in two e uh, with the DM who basically had introduced the idea of you know roll a defense as opposed to just being a static number to keep us engaged. We were all rolling dice all through the combat. It's really fun. Uh, people are like, oh, that slows down the game. Really? Does it's that a game? Or two it's a extra, game. What those two extra <laughs> seconds that might add up to maybe a minute of time over the course of the whole session? That's really slowing the game to a halt, huh? Or the third edition mentality: roll your attack and damage at the same time to speed up the game. Again, you're not really giving me a lot of time back. But this problem is, is that this speed run don't think just do build 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 make sure your character build is accurate and everything will connect lovely together and you will magically win the dungeon has now permeated an entire generation of gaming gamers and design and it's on and both it's sides I, I don't want to say war gamers but we'll just go that for the visual the war gamers want quick 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 gameplay so that it's easily understandable calculable in the head on a moment's notice and i'll just put this up here because you know you got, oops, you got, uh, come on, click on the, there we go. Um, referencing tables during a session, meh. Well, I'm not, I'm not playing a session, I'm playing a game. And, and both, ha both need to be true. So yes, referencing a table during playing a game, absolutely fine, unless you're arguing over it. If you're arguing over every little thing, that's, that's a problem. But there's literally no slowing down a game, but the LARPers want to just keep on LARPing constantly, like, oh, I'm getting out of uh, my headspace, whatever. No, it is both. It is a role-playing game. And I don't understand why why the people ever look. Why even have rules if you're going to complain about that? You ha have to look up a chart. I have to roll a die. I have to roll two dice. Oh my god! That I, how do I put them together? I, I couldn't hear you. My clutching of pearls at the mention of <laughs> tables cut off blood flow to my ears. Sorry. At the mention of tables. <laughs> yeah, like oh my god, tables. No, you know. Oh, yeah. uh, <laughs> please. Yeah, and I'm going to disagree with something that. Krantz has said about what's he making humans a super viable race choice. I well, we're we're going to actually cover that in the comments. I've got the starred okay. in, in, in the comments. So hold we'll on go. to that one. Um, uh, let's see uh, what else somebody said. To, oh, another one that I think was missed out on. I think somebody did put it in chat as well, but I wrote it down first uh, was advantage, disadvantage. I actually think that advantage, disadvantage, while not invented by Dungeons and Dragons, popularized by fifth edition is actually a really really good simple mechanic it was good it was simple when 5e came out now it's it's pointless it's a waste it's used for everything oh here's the ability it just gives you advantage or disadvantage when you do this no because <laughs> you can only either have disadvantage or advantage I thought he was going to have a rolled up piece of paper. No. <laughs> Bad gamer. It, yeah, right. <laughs> what was designed as an easy way for a DM to educate 
this your circumstances it became a core feature of every class and it just it made it point a, a cool mechanic pointless sure i mean a game can overdo it we talk about second edition and and uh bear brought up uh the black books that nobody should ever talk about and some people in chat brought the splat books the splat books are always options the splat books were things that we'd look at 90 percent be like uh, no <laughs> or you know what that might be neat let's try that i, I you know so Games, unfortunately, have that. I mean, palladium, come on, palladium. Bloat, 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 scope creep. <laughs> it's like the epitome of scope oh, creep. Wait, wait, we got to re-release the core book so that these but, class OCCs are on par with these OCCs. So so my, my point being, though, is the idea behind it and that other games, because 5e popularized it, other games have either picked it back up or popularized it themselves. Whether we like it or not is one thing, but it is... I'd say it's innovative into the hobby, even if it wasn't the first because it popularized it, if that makes sense. Dragon Bane has the best version of advantage disadvantage. Okay. Because you will always, you can roll m multiple dice if you have multiple advantage. Yeah. Or disadvantage. That's fair. Because you are limited to two dice in D&D, &D, the overuse of it now Thank you, Log Dog, for saying that. Yeah, but I think that. I think you're diving into the weeds a, 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 a little bit here. What I was just saying that the idea of the concept yeah, idea is good, but <laughs> uh, Watsy ruined a good idea. I'm saying it. Fair I enough. Mean, I have to like corporate logo like, now. I quite like advantage and disadvantage. I tend to agree. However, it is over relied upon in Five E. Um, but I, I I've been enjoying it in Shadow Dark as well, which has less uh, reliance on it. So. Cool. All right, are we ready for some uh, comments here? Do you guys have any follow-ups that you want to make? All right. Uh, let's see. Where I'm do I... Topic, no. Okay. Uh, just do, 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 do. So I guess I'm starting with Crafty. Got a few more here that weren't Super Chats, but that's okay. Uh, Crafty says, uh, what the hell is Barrett doing on his stream talking about D&D? This must be like a root canal for him. <laughs> <laughs> I was surprised no. when he said he wanted to join. I was like, wait, what? <laughs> Because I wanted to prove that my, my dislike of D&D &D has merit from having walked the miles in it, mm -hmm. as opposed to, I play vampire, d, &D stupid. I'm like, no, I've been there. I've done it. I was there when the lore was written, as they say, and I've outgrown it. But like McDonald's, I crave it every couple of times a year, you know? I get it. Okay. Uh, boop. Uh, my group was all in on Tui. We watched it come out. The brown splat books we thought were awesome. Looking back, I see the faults. Name one. But at that time, <laughs> of course, we were all younger. It was a movement. A lot of people, and I'm not saying he's doing this. This is just how I'm taking it. A lot of people like to complain about the brown splat books for 2E. If you use them as law, you're using them wrong. If you use them as inspiration for your own setting or for a neat idea like, oh, that kit was actually pretty cool. I'm surprised uh, we haven't had that. And you want to bring it in, then you're using them right. The, yeah. the issue is, is when people say it's a published, it's published by TSR, you must accept it. No, there were different settings for different purposes. Dr Dragonlance, as was mentioned earlier, is a perfect example. A lot of the stuff that you'd find in the core book didn't exist in Dragonlance. It rewrote Absolutely. the stuff for the setting. You have to stay true to the setting. But I thought they were great for inspiration, though. Bear uh, said he loved the Fighter's Handbook. I hated almost everything. And the tight groups and broad groups were the dumbest thing to happen to Dungeons & Dragons ever. Be Love it. Yeah, it didn't make any sense. And I'm not saying it didn't make a sense in reality, but in Dungeons & Dragons, it made them, it kind of superpowered them. Let me, I let really... me get my clown shoes and uh, put them on, and then we can argue. <laughs> I really like the Thief's Handbook. That's one I, I like a lot, yeah. There's a lot of great stuff in there with you know the different kinds of things you can do with the thief class, and you throw in where you're a failed like wizard, kind of like a farfed. You have the ability to do that. I think it had a lot of good stuff in it. I think all the handbooks had a lot of good stuff, and you just had to pick and choose what was going to work yeah. for you. And, and I think the, that was the intent. Mm -hmm. The complete the cleric's handbook was great if you wanted to make a pantheon. That really helped you out with that. If you actually compared them to the published settings, though, the pantheons were weak. I've done, I did. I went through the entire book step Wait, by which step. Were weak? Huh? The, the the ones out of the priest handbook were weak. That's such okay. limited spheres or schools, sorry. Okay. Or no, it is spheres. No, it's here. Schools are uh, wizards. wizards, yeah. 
Uh, Law Dog says, uh, you just broke 6K subscribers. Congrats. Awesome. Thank you. That's all. Thank you to you folks out there. You know, I still have one last giveaway for the 5,000 subscriber giveaway to do that I, I, I am now officially started to forget about. I have one more to do. Maybe we'll call it the 6,000 subscriber. Here have Max's crap giveaway. So, but thank you to you folks out there and all the super chatters and folks. Uh, we're back up to good numbers today. Unlike last week, apparently nobody wanted to watch a live stream about kids and role playing. That was weird. But uh, so thank you very much to everybody who's here. Bodog also says, I think advantage disadvantage was useful and quick mechanic. It has become a bit overused. So I think that's what these guys were saying as well. Am I correct? Yeah. Yeah. Get these off the screen here. Save that one. All right. Craft Matt for five dollars says TSR was simpler than WotC to run. Codifying the rules complicates the game. Yes, we joke about Pathfinder and, and Dungeons and Dragons Third Edition being an encyclopedia now, because there is a rule for everything, and everything has a rule. And in the old editions, if you change something, you didn't have such an impressive butterfly effect. You change something in Pathfinder or Third Edition D and D, mm -hmm. you have no clue how that <laughs> where those waves are going to hit that butterfly effect down the road. You're like, uh oh. I just broke the game. Any thoughts? No, no, I agree with you on that. That was a big problem with 30. You didn't know. You make one change and there's going to be a ripple effect. And I will bring this up right now. We will we will do this right now. Uh, we'll do it quickly, though. I hope the panel covers the topic how progressive additions. This is for Malachi because he wanted to bring it up so he gets to start. Uh, how progressive additions of D&D have impacted, plus or minus, the importance and popularity of humans. Go ahead, Malachi. Start off. D&D, as originally intended, was a humanocentric game. 1E and 2E, with the way with uh, race and class choices confirms that want to be a paladin uh, you gotta be a human too bad nothing else can't be a known paladin by god is written what happened was they opened it oh and there were level limits too let's not forget level limits human pretty severe level limits in first edition <laughs> depending on the race and class combination yes uh except for thief i think everybody was unlimited thief but I don't anyway remember. Once you get to third edition, they open it up. Oh, you, everybody can be everything. Everybody can be every, max level and whatever they want to be in. Come on, Malachi, use my quote. What did I call the game? Clown shoes? No, the other C word. Kami role playing. Yeah, Kami role playing. That's right. <laughs> Kami role playing. And they had to do something to make up for the loss of what the. The importance of playing humans and they just get oh here's a feed here's some skill points at every level well and one of the problems is is that as a result of all of the multi the the, the the planet of the hats mentality of you know let's go to the dwarf bakery and pick up some dwarf bread and then stop by the uh the elf cafe and get some elf tea and then Latte. go over to the like, it's <laughs> help it's, it's pumpkin spice it's flicking Moss Eisley Cantina time. Every time you propose running a game, you'll be lucky if someone says they want to play a human yeah. anything. Yeah. And why would they? Because there's it, no benefit to playing a human yeah. anymore. And 5e kind of fixed it because the variant let, human. Let, let Harmony say something. Oh, no, oh it's okay. Enough. <laughs> um, ahead, I, I was. Sorry. I was going to say it takes away from the mysterious mythos behind other creatures when you just, well, you have a little goblin in your party and he's totally welcome in the tavern and nobody's giving you weird looks at all. It's, it, it takes away from the, uh, fr from the innate chaotic evil of the race. It takes away. Oh, from they don't have to be chaotic evil. You're just being close minded. <laughs> It's well, a I mean, recommended. And, and, and some, it, it's an intelligent race. Like what if it was raised? What if it was raised by humans? What if it was raised by a, um, a household of elves? And I think that some things like drow or like goblins can have this like mystical, uh, mysterious feel to them mm -hmm. when they're not in the party, when they're not just random adventures, but you see them in caves or in the woods and you don't know exactly what's going to happen, but it's not going to be good. And I mean, not just the evil races, but the good races too, because um, I, I tend to enjoy um, 
I, I tend to enjoy lore where elves tend to go off by themselves because why would they associate with mortal races like humans when humans are fleeting and there's no point investing in them or investing in their wars because they'll outlive them anyway, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I tend to enjoy that sort of mythos a lot. But when you have like the adventuring party that's an elf, a dwarf, a gnome, a halfling, and a half goblin, half tiefling, then like you you, you lose that. You, you, you lose the mysteriousness of these races. You know what? I can't stand. I'll say this point blank because I've seen way too many YouTube videos about it. I'm playing a tabaxi that acts like my house cat. <clears throat> oh, look, the funny tabaxi just knocks something off the counter. Tee hee hee hee. Like, oh my God. What the hell is going on in D and D these days? It's like furry central all of a sudden. Mm -hmm. Well, it's it, my it, first D and D character at eighteen. You just described it perfectly. I'm so sorry. <laughs> it's okay. Sad. You're forgiving well, you know, me. You're, you're starting. It's you're your starting. Character. Character. Okay. Uh, it was funny at the time. I promise. When I did it, it was funny. <laughs> she was the one exception. <laughs> I insist. It's funny. Uh, <laughs> The second edition, I thought, had the best way of describing it. Uh, I forget the page number. I used to know the page numbers exactly, uh, where you'd find about it. You you don't make Durgar into something good because that's not their intent. They're not meant to be humans in funny skin suits. They're meant to be distinctly unique races that, yes... The term is bioessentialism, whether it's created by a god, say like the oryx with grumpsh, or mm -hmm. it's something oh. that is just, you know, as uh, as Harmony was saying with the elves, they've been around for so long, they're going to continue to be around, and they just are stand off and look, look let these little roach humans do what they're going to do, as long as they don't come here, we're fine, and just ignore them for a few generations, like, it's hard for a human to think like them, and it should be hard for a human to think like them. Why would a dwarf just stay so insanely stubborn that he knows he's going to die? Because he's a dwarf. Well, that doesn't make he sense. He, he's, he's smarter than that. He's a dwarf. Uh, you know, the, uh, Alluvial uh, Silverwings, uh, we did what you said. We ignored the humans, and I know it's only been a year, which is like I got up this morning, and it was last year. Uh, they've cut down all the trees. What should we do now? <laughs> Now like it's time to, yeah, not now it's time to, you know, like you don't go to the elf freaking cafe. <laughs> right. Uh, I did that in Kingsgate. I literally put all of those stupid tropes in there, hoping they would stick out like a sore thumb for people to see how dumb they were. The elven tea room and all this kind of <laughs> stuff. Nope, people just think they're fabulous ideas. Fantastical. Yeah, the the other thing to go back on the original question though is talk about why you know people playing more more humans. Uh, now, to be fair, when I was younger, I played a lot of uh, dwarves. Uh, I like playing gnomes, but I mean, when I say gnomes, I'm not talking the World of Warcraft gnomes or the stupid tinker gnomes from Dragonlance. I'm talking the way gnomes are presented in Dungeons and Dragons. I like oh, playing David gnomes. The gnome. What's that? David the gnome. I don't know the what that is. The pointy hat. No. Uh, so stop it. <laughs> Stop ruining my childhood. Uh, but but and it wasn't because, oh, humans are boring or anything like that. It's like because I actually liked the challenge. My game masters were dungeon masters. We were actually good about you're not playing the norm. Okay. And I, I was willing to be put in that situation. You're going to have level limitations. Well, good, thank God Second Edition has some leeway around that with multi-classing and, and a little bit of a lift on the level restrictions if you play by op optional rules. But I didn't care. I understood that with the character, and the humans were going to surpass me. It's okay. Are you playing the long game? Are you playing a character? Are you playing, you know, like Harmony was saying before, are you going for domain play? Does it matter that I'm a level 20 gnome if I still have my domain? Uh, what's a gnome domain? Just curious. Anyway, uh, you know, uh, ultimate, what's that? A garden. There you go. I got my my big garden with all the squirrels that I can talk to. The 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 point being is, humans are the diversity trope. You can be whatever you want. Basically, when you're playing a human, uh, if you want to do something special, but they come with weaknesses. Well, I got dark vision, right? 
but you also have lower attributes over or ability scores over here. You have, oh, you're immune to sleep and charm. Well, that's great. But, uh, you know, once you hit like eighth level, you're not going anywhere. You have to accept those. You can't have the good and not have the bad as well. And that's what I see a lot of, or hear about a lot of people dropping. And I have to read a super chat. I just got interrupted. So yep. uh, Crafty for $20 interrupts me to say, I have a theory on why D&D has changed like Bear described. So many people lack meaningful face-to-face -face friendships um, or, or in-person hangout that people are now role-playing parties, proms, coffee shops because they lack that. That went a weird direction, okay? What do, you, what do you have to say about that, Bear? As much as I ever, ever hate to admit Crafty is right about anything. <laughs> like, seriously, like, water's wet? Fuck you, Crafty, you're wrong. Uh, sorry, that was my one F-bomb for the PG-13. Um, he's right on this one. He's 100% right on this one. There was an ad that came out during the three, I think maybe even fourth edition, I can't remember which one it was, where there was a full-page ad. I was flipping through a magazine that had nothing to do with D&D. And suddenly there was this full page ad of a guy in a, you know, preppy suit sitting at his computer and it said, hey, if you're going to sit in your basement and pretend you're an elf, why don't you do it with other people? Dungeons that was third edition. Blah, 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 blah. And I was like, Malachi, oh. you don't have to correct everybody every time. No, I remember that ad. <laughs> I yes. really, well, really actually, feel bad for your sorry. character at the next Codex Albana session, buddy. <laughs> Such a salient point. You know, it only now occurs to me that the Strixhaven book, the 5e Strixhaven book, the book of the, the book where you get to go to Magic Prom released mm -hmm. and targeted a younger generation. It seemed to be targeting people in their early 20s, late teens right after COVID hit and they all missed their real life problems. Yeah. Sure. Whoa. Yeah. Or that, that whole adventure of being in uh, what was that mm -hmm. the, the, with the cafe where they were at the Coffee cafe. Yeah, and you got experience points for the Rubinica? orders that you served. Yeah. It was Rubinica, right? No, I, I no, thought that was a no, DM's was guild thing, but hated. Was it strict saving? Either way, okay. it, 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 anyway, was, it was literally going, and now that you missed your prom, get ready for when we get back into the workforce because you're going to be working at Starbucks, baby. You know, like just, <laughs> yeah. thank you for practicing in your imagination. Yeah, that was good, Kathy. That was good. <laughs> All right, let's hit uh, uh, let's a couple more to chat here so we can. Uh, from me. There you go. Well done, Harmony. You're welcome to the group. You're one of the boys. <laughs> uh, so, Law Dog for $10, thank you very much, says some races are evil. Their gods literally created them for world domination and absolute tyranny. Orcs. Over. All, uh, all other living things. Orcs are evil because their god tells them to be. They have no choice. You know what happened when, with the drought when that happened and somebody wanted to play a good one and they found they could market it? They made a good god for the drought. No, it's low they're nothing. <laughs> oh, yeah. I, I like Estrella. I, I used her well in a campaign. I liked her. But I also made her evil. <laughs> Secretly. Oh. She was just basically, you know, pretending to be good to lure out people that she would then betray to her sister. Fair enough. Um, okay. Mother, it's whatever. so counter to everything I believe in D and D. I I enjoy the evil races. I enjoy like the the, the orcs and, but man, I, I I'm I'm with Bear. I like the I, I like the good drill. We I now we can. You friends. know what? At first I was saying we can be friends. Now we can't. Um, <laughs> Gingers <laughs> unite! <laughs> Gingers <laughs> unite! <There you> go. <laughs> Uh, let's see here. <laughs> we up read that one. So Agile Monk for 499. Thank you very much. Agile Monk says, Ms. Harmony Ginger, I don't know you, but your love for the AD and D DMG and your thoughts shared touched my 50 years as a player and 48 years as a GM heart. There you go. Awesome. Well, apparently she's getting love on this stream. The love is for me. For oh, wait, I got the 499 love so she can have the word love. <laughs> Thank you so much, Agile Monk. I appreciate that. Awesome. Uh, let's move on to the next question. We are running, as always, we're running God a little. Damn it, nerds, nerd. <laughs> yes, I saw that. <laughs> we'll just put that on the screen as I move on to the next. Uh, uh, who am I starting with here? It looks like I'm bear. back up to Bear. Yep. Oh, it's me. Yes, bear. it's you, Bear. I got to get my card so I can. Up oh, there it is. All right, Bear. Yeah. Let me get that off the screen here. Uh, how do the character creation processes differ between TSR and Watsi editions? And which do you prefer and why? 
This is, by the way, this isn't about the step by steps. This is about the theory behind the character creation process. Okay. I'm a dirty, filthy story gamer. I like race as class, mm. but I also like making extra racial classes for the races if I'm going to have those races more involved in my world than just being those strange people that live over there that we never talk to. Uh, otherwise, I prefer the BX system for making characters, though with some of the OSE advanced stuff thrown in for fun. Uh, I really, 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 really hate 3rd edition, 4th edition, and 5th edition character creation. Why? Because they encourage... It's like playing champions. It's just encouraging players to min-max and find this works with this, and this gives me that, and then I have this. So as a result, all the stuff that's good about, say, feats, and there are good things about feats, or class abilities, and there are good things about class abilities, get lost in the absolute deluge of dirty, shitty flood water that these bring into the game and make the characters just, as everyone likes to say in the OSR, a sheet. I like a little bit of it, but not a lot of it, which is why if you ever ask me what my preferred D and D is, it's always going to be BX because it's the most modular and easier to build, easiest to build on, remove without breaking. But I think the original D and D, you weren't supposed to think of a character until the dice hit the table, and then you knew what you could play, right? Mm -hmm. If you're going by later, strictly, yep, right yeah. down the list, yep. Third edition and later, you came up with an idea and then figured out how to make everything work because there were no limitations anymore. I think both have a merit and both have a fault. The merit of the roll the dice and see where they wind up makes the character exist in that moment. You haven't thought about the whole character coming up to the session. You're like, I don't know play. Let's roll some dice and find out. Ah, crap. Looks like I'm a cleric, right? Versus... And that's a good thing, but it's also a bad thing because as a result, you might have less investment in that character until they survive a couple of sessions. The good thing about the modern stuff is that it lets you think of an idea for a character in advance and maybe really sort of get into it and think what you're going to do and bring the character to life from session one because you've got some ideas. The bad thing is the overplanning, the expectations, the, the, the build mentality and all that stuff, which is absolute poop and therefore not fun. So that's, I would say, is the primary differences between the two. They both have merits. They both have flaws. Did that answer your question, Max, or did I not? Did I come all it? <laughs> <laughs> you don't get political here. Uh, no, you, you answered the question. Um, I, I'm, I'm thinking about which uh, follow-up I wanted to ask, though. This Why one, I'm so pretty is a good follow-up question. I, you know what? It is, but we ask it every time, so we don't need to ask it again. Uh, so since you touched on it, we'll go with... Let's talk about both positive and negative okay, effects. So what are the positive and negative effects of the removal as racist class limitations have on the game? What are the positive effects of the removal of racist yes. class? Yes. You can do anything. You can recreate any character you've seen in a movie or in a book or in your, 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 your dear diary. Today I was an elf running in the woods who was also a ranger. Like, whatever. You can do anything. So that's a bonus in that your, your, your creativity and your imagination is fully unfettered at that point in time. And you have the world is your oyster. And then what are, what are the, uh, the negative effects? I think you touched on already, but the negative effects of the removal of racist class. Wow, everybody's boring and the same, and elves aren't special, and, and hobgoblins aren't special, and halflings aren't special. Dude, we once in a uh, 1E game legitimately kidnapped a hobbit or a halfling in a tavern because we needed a thief and we just decided well he's a halfling he must be a thief grab him that <laughs> wasn't a fucking thief sorry i'm swearing i apologize um the guy wasn't a freaking thief but we still grabbed him and we press ganged him into service in the dungeon and then he you know tripped a trap got half of us killed and ran away <laughs> while we all bled out it was hilarious there we go that wouldn't be fun because I spent a lot of time on my 29-page backstory. Uh, all right. Yeah, okay. uh, let's, let's bounce this down to Harmony Ginger here. Same question for you. How do character creation processes differ between TSR and Watsy editions? Which do you prefer and why? Right. 
I think he hit on a lot of the major points, uh, the down the line stats versus the versus the um, assign them as you will. Basically, in the newer editions of D&D, you can plan your character in advance, whereas you couldn't before. And I have to say, I always thought starting with um, st starting with the WotC editions, because I started with the uh, 3.5 back a while ago. But um, starting with that, I always thought rolling stats down the line and being assigned a character to play would be not the greatest thing. However, I've come to realize that limitations breed creativity. Oh, and my God. I, you Another I'm sorry for interrupting, but another one. Uh -huh. Yes, 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 yes. I keep hearing this from people who started with three, four and five E that that line right there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for for bringing that up. And. When my character dies and I'm playing Watt C D and D, I have to think, oh, I have to come up with another character idea. Okay, uh, <laughs> let's think about this for a while. But in old editions where I just roll the stats down the line, uh, when my character dies, I think, I wonder what my next character is gonna be. This is exciting now because this is this is a game. I roll down the line. Okay, I looks like I'm a wizard. Um, now, all right, do do I get one of these super rare abilities? I don't know until I roll it, right? Because you don't roll your character ahead of time. It, it's only like rolled when your character dies. So mm -hmm. this is this is it turns character death into a new opportunity. And that's mm -hmm. what I really like about the old uh, the old rolling the way they do. So I, 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 I love the fact that you said that because I hear this from so many people that started with third edition because, because on paper, they're like, Oh no, that would be dumb. I want to have more control over, but you come to find out that the limitations absolutely breed imagination. Okay. How am I going to make this happen within these limitations? And they start thinking more, they start actually having more fun with it. Usually, at least in my experience, when I'm talking to folks like this, yeah, I love that you said that as well. It just seems to be a consistent thing. And I'd love it if people out there who don't know the older versions of games, this isn't just true about D&D, it's about other games as well. You'll find that a lot of the older games had more limitations, but that's also what gave them more heart and soul. Uh, let's do, 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 yeah. Okay, no, I'll ask you this one. This is kind of a, a, a cheese ball question, but uh, <laughs> what are the positive and negative effects did ascending armor have on the game? That's a contentious uh, armor class, sorry, to ascending armor class. Because as most people know, TSR used descending armor class, where lower wow. armor class was better. Third edition changed that to, to uh, ascending armor class, which the higher armor class number is better. I mean, I've I've played both. I've mostly played ascending AC because I've mostly played wizards D and D, but um. To me, it wasn't too difficult to learn how to read a chart for Paco. Um, it, it, I did. I never really cared that much. I mean, I'm gonna be a. Um, I, I'm gonna stand for wizards here and say I like bigger number better. I <laughs> like bigger number is good. I like that. Um, also, it kind of um, de facto didn't put a limit on it by the way it worked because uh, descending AC, I mean, can't go lower than a certain point, I believe, but um, ascending AC can technically go up to like 30, 40, who knows? Um, I've never seen it go that high, but honestly, I, um, I, I don't really care that much about the distinction. It's, okay. That's never been a point of contention for me. I'm happy so to play either. Do you I guess one of my issues, and this is specifically with third edition, I didn't see it in five um, because of what bounded accuracy or whatever they call it. But when my modifier is higher than the die that I'm rolling, I kind of think it's pointless to roll a die. And I really saw that a lot in third edition and Pathfinder. It's like, okay, you got a plus 22. Like, what? And, and you needed those. I was like To me, the, it, it got out of hand. Uh, I generally, well, actually, no, because I got to ask the same question for uh, for Malachi, so I won't, uh, won't dive into that. But... Uh, yeah, I, I, I think they both have merits. Yeah, I, I'm not too bothered about the distinction between the two. I've played them both. I'm not, I don't mind Thaco. I, I think I have a slight preference for Ascending AC. Sure. It's probably more intuitive for most folks too. <laughs> to me, that's one of the distinctions between old and new editions that I just don't care about. I that's know that's fair. like a non-answer, but I really don't care. <laughs> Is it an honest answer? If it's an honest answer, we're good. Yeah. Malachi. Yeah. Back to you. 
how do the character creation processes differ between TSR and WotC editions? Which do you prefer and why? Yeah, those two really, I think, hit the stuff on the head for me as well. And I really felt like when it came, once you got to the WotC era, it was, here's a character I want to play. Here's my backstory. Let's make it for the game. <laughs> Where as rolling up your characters, whether you use one of the alternate methods in the DMG, and I think I can move the player's handbook into E, you could still get a little bit of you know wiggle room on what you were playing, but it was still let the dice at the table. What what am I coming up with? I kind of prefer that. I like a little bit of surprise. You know, what am I gonna play this time? You know, it's a little bit, I think it's a little bit easier to create a character too, a little bit quicker. And I think, you know, well, you get a lot of the optional stuff like the feats and everything, the later editions and all the abilities. And it's just like, oh my, it's just like too much. The older I get, the more I want a little bit of a simpler system. Don't play my game. Uh, <laughs> oh, mine. Would you, uh, would you consider 5e subclasses the same as AD and D2e's kits? Why or why not? I, I see where they were going with subclasses, and I think subclasses in general were better than more than multiple classes. And they kind of like kits, but not, I mean. So for the, for, for, well, while he's thinking, his brain's on tilt. Uh, no, but no. let me explain to folks out there who might not oh, know. Yeah. If you're a modern gamer and you play 5e, you pretty much know what subclasses are. You, you're a wizard, and then you're some sort of, I wouldn't call it specialist, but you're no. some sort of derivative of the wizard, so to speak, right? Yeah, in, you're AD, in AD and D second edition, you had kits. So you might have a thief that was an acrobat. What well, first edition we had thief acrobat? I know, but you'd have one that might be an acrobat. You might have be have one that's a cut purse. And the differences are you probably start with a different non-weapon proficiency and uh, you might have a limitation here but a bonus there especially with the thief skill chart yep. uh, you might have a bonus you know so it's something to tweak your character from the start that still keeps you in the same class that you are very similar to the concept behind subclasses but subclasses were like a, I, I think are like a full build yeah they are I will agree with that there it adds uh, another level of a I think a needed complexity. I think, you know, you could do away with the subclass and just, I hate to say it, Wizards doesn't want to do this, but dead level, dead level, dead level. It's fine. You can have dead levels and just get hit points. I think, yeah. Okay. And All I right. do want, go ahead. I want to piggyback on Harmony's question about the AC. Mm -hmm. A set descending, when you actually look, at uh, the rule cyclopedia, you look at that chart, you get to a certain point where you hit ACs where you can only miss when you roll a one. You roll, but then you're adding your Thaco to the damage you deal. That is something you don't get with ascending AC. It's true. Um, if that's a rule in the game, I've been playing wrong my entire life because I didn't know about that rule. Yeah, it's I only see it in Rule Cyclopedia. And it's Oh, oh, okay, okay. <laughs> Never mind then. Yeah. I, I like yeah, the idea it... behind it though, because that yeah. would be one of the things that would be kind of a problem is like, oh crap, I can't make really anything hard. <laughs> like this thing's got armor class negative ten. What am I supposed to do now? Negative <laughs> twelve? Like Especially when yeah, you got but, a magic fighter, you know, a, you know, nineteenth level fighter with you know a plus four sword with you know strength bonus and so forth. It's like, okay, you hit, dude. We just we just know you hit. How many did you cleave? All of them. Great. Let's move on. Um, I wrote down a couple of notes here, um, and I think we're going to get into this in comments uh, also. I could be wrong about this, but I seem to remember I played a lot of third edition in the early 2000s, and I seem to remember almost all of my characters were point by, not rolled. That was an option. 
Was it okay? Most of the yeah. people that, that I played with when I played, you know, when I left the Air Force, got back to Minnesota, or when I played in Kuwait, when I played in Japan, because those are all th- 3E games, they were point by games. And I know that there's this weird mentality of balance, 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 which is an illusion. It's yeah. stupid. Nobody should even think about yeah. it. Uh, well, what happens if your character's all nines? Great, I'm a fighter, and let's just see what happens. You know, uh, you don't you know, have any negative. Well, oh, right, but also no, yeah, it's, no a, negative. it's a class-based game. You can still cast spells when I can't. You know, there, there doesn't matter necessarily what, about those attributes. Um, and I think two, at least two of you, mentioned something close to this. And I'll use my sorcerer example. And I think somebody in chat said this. I think it started. Oh, hold on. I have to look at my sorcerer. Great. Okay, I have all my spells plotted out between now and level 20. Well, we need you to do this. has literally happened. People have heard this story before. Hey, we need somebody that can learn Compian languages. Nah, dude. I can't take Compian languages because I'll screw up all my synergy between my 15th level and 12th level of spells that I'm going to have, so on and so forth. If they don't play organically. They have this pre-programmed crap out. I think somebody said it in terms of feats, but I saw it with the sorcerer and spells. It's like, we need somebody who can do this. Nope, not going to be me because then I get myself at level, you know, whatever. It's like, oh, my god and i i like organic play okay i agree i'm the same way yeah. did you want to did someone to disagree with you i mean i could if you like but no, it would be not necessarily disagree just i want to give you time to jump in if you want to <laughs> that's my oh, maybe i'll jump in when i want to max you know that Tell yes me i think get the fluffy blankets. three three and later ruin multi-classing well, I mean, multi- everybody was multi-class in three, technically, weren't they? Everybody I mean, was multi-class. Dun, 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 dun. Stop it! <laughs> Stop it! Everybody right, was. Okay. Well, la, 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 la. Multi-classing broke the game. Okay. When you multi-class in one E and two E, there were penalties, there were restrictions, mm-hmm. there were costs to having that yeah. power. Three, yep. there was none. No. Nope. Five E, oh my God, it makes no sense. But let's. Let's talk about the worst thing, and, and I know I've been holding up the Unearthed Arcana and singing its praises, but you notice I said Cavalier and not Barbarian. Yeah. Right? Barbarian's yeah. the worst goddamn class ever created. Mm-hmm. It, from the Unearthed Arcana to 3E to 4 to 5 to 5 point, whatever the hell this version is, it is the dumbest thing you can have. I know what they want, I know what they're going for, but for some reason they were so hesitant to just call it a berserk and go that way, mm-hmm. which is what it's supposed to be. So now they've added all this tribal mystical garbage to it and trying to make it it's silly but didn't it originally start off as somebody that hated magic too yes because it was originally based on conan conan yeah uh now it's just a garbage thing people dip into to get some rage and some extra hit Mm -hmm. points and garbage like this and there's the problem the word dip into Mm -hmm. i'm going to dip into so harmony's playing a wizard her character's backstory is, you know what? I studied. I went to magic school. I got an owl, and the big hairy guy said, "Harmony, you're a wizard." And then we were off to the races. Lovely. Max is playing a thief. I'm a scumbag from the streets of of, of, of true. water deep, and I'm you know whatever. You know what? Level three. I'm going to take a level of wizard now, and I'm equally as powerful at magic as Harmony was at first level. Sorry, Bear, but I have to interrupt you. I know. I see it. $50 super chat. Thank you very much, Lord Mateus. This means I have to drink and my wife is not watching. So I will have to pause this after we get to the next question for just a moment so I can go get a shot. Uh, it's been happening more and more recently. Uh, so, oh, you don't have to drink. Yes, I do. It's in, it's in the rules <laughs> and I have rules I have to follow. Don't have to drink, but you have to say with enthusiasm, go to Giant Slayer Games and back the deck of many triggers. Man, I've seen a bunch of videos on that. So there we go. Go to Giant Slayer Games. Go uh, back the deck of many triggers. Do it not. No, nope, do it after you're done watching this video. <laughs> mm-hmm. Check it. So uh, appreciate that. Thank you for the fifty dollars, Lord Amadeus, who's on the show last week. Uh, I might be involved in that one. I'm a stretch might, goal. I'm a stretch do, goal. Do yeah. tell. I'm just. I, I don't really have much to tell. I'm a stretch goal for that. I might uh, okay. if, they, if they get a certain amount of funding, I might I might have a trigger card. I don't know. Okay, we'll oh, see. Okay. I was like, how, how are you a stretch? What is going on? Yeah, I was gonna say crazy. I, listen, I'm in Canada. The RCMP might get involved. I don't know what's happening anymore. I'm I don't know what you mean. <laughs> <laughs> okay, All right. alcohol is coming. So yeah, I will say that. 
please. I totally had something to say and I forgot it now after that. <laughs> Multiclassing barbarians, wizards, the guy yes. used to do it. Yes. Okay. I'm sorry. Malachi started to talk and I interrupted him for some hot nonsense. So please go. <laughs> okay. It happens here all the all time. Right. Well, I, I tend to agree that dips are generally a bad thing most of the time. I have kind of like this uh, dip rule where I really hate multiclassing, except there are some situations where like if it just organically goes with a story, like my favorite one, a class that I don't believe was in AD&D, uh, the Warlock. I love warlocks in WotC editions. I really do. And I that might make me a heretic to some people, but uh, warlock dipping is the most fun thing for me. And the reason is if you find like this uh, horrific patron, like a devil or an abolith or something, uh, something just, I don't know, really powerful that you can make a deal with in game and you get that little warlock dip. I love that. That's like so one I've only played 5e oh. twice, once when it was D&D Next when we were playtesting and once uh, a couple years ago when I, oh god, it's like four years ago now, wow, when I was in Germany, so, and I played a warlock. I love character classes like that conceptually, but you have to have a game master that is willing to use all the negative effects of the warlock against you, and guess what, my game master did, so I was like, yeah. uh, like this whole idea of like, oh, we're not going to worry about all the evil stuff you have to do, we're just going to gloss over that, or now you can be a good warlock no like there's a reason for that to exist and when you play into that and make that part of the world part of the character and part of the story i am 100 percent in on that yeah i just i like my warlock dips because of that and and don't worry i'm i'm a nasty game master so <laughs> awesome uh where are we in the comments here uh yeah, if you want to dip in the warlock, you got to find the patron first. Exactly. Like, oh, man, I don't like because the thing is in like uh, in at least 5e, I don't think this was a thing in 3, but um, I, I don't play much 4, so I don't know. I, but uh, in 5e, the warlock dip is so good sometimes if you get like that right subclass and you want the blade warlock dip to go with your paladin. Hex blade, which there you is go. Just the most heretical thing, like a... um. A paladin that has that hex blade warlock dip. Like everybody wants that. It's like the best thing a paladin can do. Can you believe that? It's like the complete opposite. And then of you lost me. Paladin. It just it just destroys the mythos behind the paladin to do that. But every paladin wants to, which is why I eventually said, find the patron, then we'll talk. Yeah, I wouldn't let a paladin do that. You're either going to be a paladin or a, war a hexblade. I, so I played the hexblade also. I also mm -hmm. refuse to take, what's the one ability that warlocks get that you have to have? Blah, blah, blah. Arcane purple. Eldritch 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 Blast. Blast. Oh, yeah. Yep, I refuse to take it because everybody said I had to take it. I, <laughs> yeah. I know what you, you mean. You contrarian? No way. Well, no, because, I mean, the class should be viable without it. And I had other abilities. I had, like, this little haste ability. I could spit acid. That was pretty cool. So, I, anyway, back on track here. I, I agree with you, Harmony. I like classes that are like that, but I would never sully a paladin personally with that. I would make him lose his power and then make a choice. Do you want to be a paladin or do you want to be a warlock? And then have that become part of his either atonement or fall into, you know, Darth Vaderhood, you know? Oh, yeah. Definitely Are makes no sense. Go on. Let's uh let's uh, pop into these chats here. A nerd's nerd says, I like planned characters, but is a problem when people start talking about and this is what I was getting at with the sorcerer. My character doesn't work uh until the feat I get at level nine. Well, there's gonna be a long time until level nine. Mm -hmm. Um, excuse me, I don't think you're allowed to be up there. Little guy. Okay, he doesn't listen. Feral cat, by the way. I don't uh, know why you thought a cat would listen. <laughs> right. Uh, Gunther the Mad says, I don't understand all these weird ways to generate characteristics as kids in these states. Uh, roll 3d6 six, six times, accept it like Krom intended. There you go. Uh, Lord Mattias, before the super chat, said, Late to the party, but I heard Harmony lay it down that the constraints breed creativity. She's 100% right. The old school is properly represented. Yep, I cannot disagree with her on that one. All right, let's move on to the next question. I don't want to have a nine-hour stream tonight. 
Uh, by the way, chat is really hopping. I really appreciate that. Uh, a lot of good comments in there. Because we're getting so many super chats, by the way, folks, I'm sure you know this if you watch the stream long enough. Yes, we will have a giveaway in segment five today. Uh, Harmony, just to put it out there for you right now, you do not have to hang out for segment five. Uh, once segment four is over, if you want to go, you can. If you want to hang out, you're welcome to do so either way. I'll, uh, I'll go to bed. So. <laughs> well, we're halfway there. So let's uh, let's help you do that. Uh, we are to, looks like, yeah, we're starting with Harmony for this one. So uh, how do the approaches to balance and game fairness differ between TSR and WotC editions? And what impact does this have on gameplay? Oh, boy. Um, WotC cares about balance, TSR really didn't. And uh, I don't think that's a good thing for WotC. Um, I think that there is a lot more balancing of everything. Everything's homogenized now. Do, like they, okay, with every edition, they balance things more and more. Like in um, uh, just a recent example in 5e, everyone has their subclasses. They get at levels one, two, or three, depending on the class. And in, in 5.5 or 6 C or 5 E 20, 24, or whatever it is, everyone gets their class at, subclass at level three. So if you're a cleric, what master do you serve? Like what, what what's your what's your god? I don't know. I'm just a cleric until level three. We'll find out. Yeah, um, just, you, you just can, a wandering <laughs> random priest. Yeah. I, I don't know yet. Like you That's don't have so to make these decisions level oriented. three in the name of balance, which is silly because this isn't like a this isn't necessarily a PvP game. I mean, if you're if you're going to the domain play and you're using this like with pain <laughs> mail back in like zero e, maybe maybe it can be, but like it, it's just it's ridiculous how much they're going through to like homogenize and balance everyone. They don't they they want to uh they they want to make um martial classes better to stand up to high level wizards like they don't need to a everyone everyone serves a role like you don't need the cleric to be as powerful as the fighter you just don't it's okay i mean it, in fact asymmetrical games like um the fact that uh everything isn't balanced i i think makes the game more interesting because it's it's playing a less powerful character with maybe crappy stats and um you know you're you're just like a fighter with like a 10 strength because that's what you rolled like that's that's an, a more fun experience than it sounds like it's going to be we and need to convert you to palladium <laughs> do do you okay May, maybe someday Ma um, Mal malachi will, malachi will do it <laughs> But a lot of this stuff, like, I mean, playing weak classes, playing weak stats, it, you end up having more fun with it than you think you're going to. Because accomplishing things as a weaker character than everybody else is really, really cool. That's all I have to add on that. Okay. So we're, we're going to, I'm going to have to do a follow-up that's in a little bit different vein here. Mm -hmm. So because, you know, we were talking about balance and fairness or whatever, <clears throat> which are two terms I can't stand. But, uh, well, fairness is, is a little bit different, I guess. But can you share an example of a house rule or a modification you made to a TSR edition game? I should probably do the WotC. I will say WotC for you. WotC edition game. Uh, oh, and, and why you felt that it was necessary. Give give the millennial WotC, I understand. Um, <laughs> it was the right <laughs> choice. Do you, do, you want, do you want the TSR one? You can have the no. one. <laughs> it was the correct choice. I'm just giving you shit over. I'm stalling. Um <laughs> Right. Um, let's see. A modification I made. I I play fairly rules as written. Um, okay. I, I I forbid multiclassing unnecessarily, like without a reason, too, because I think it's stupid. Um, I don't I don't like people multiclassing until they have a reason to. But that's not really a balanced thing. Um, I. Mm. If, you know, I, I if you're, if you're pretty much rules my head, written. like a house rule, I, I play fairly rules as written, okay. at least in the spirit of rules as written. I do make a couple back. I, I too do make a couple changes, but um, if you don't mind, I, I so can you name one of those changes? One that I, yeah, I use, um, I, I use reaction rules, even though they aren't in 5e. Okay. Uh, when I run 5e, I use reaction rules. Um, let's see, that's the first one I can come up with. There are like a bunch of them, and I have a whole list of them that I have to bring up now. Uh, I use <laughs> random tables from like AD and D when I run Five E, which is um, I don't know. I guess a house rule. Um, man, 
you ask me to uncover my house rule secrets just on the fly. What, what, but you know, uh, actually, you've like kind that. of said what, what uh, yeah. in a way, what I was looking for. You said reaction roles, you use random tables. So you're actually bringing in a lot of the old school mentality, even with a more modern rule set. So yeah. conceptually, they can exist together. I, I, I try to do that. Um, okay. Yeah, I, I, man. I've, I've tried a bunch of things over the years and I've ended up throwing them out. Um, but uh, that to me sounds like the mark of a good mm -hmm. game master that recognizes because I've done the same thing, tried some of the oops, that didn't work as well as I thought, or oh, that worked better yeah. than I thought. That you've got to, you don't know until you try it, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. Like I, I have a couple house rules, but like nothing that, n nothing that major. Okay. I don't know. Let's I, move on. We'll yeah. move over to Sorry. Malachi here. No, you're good. <laughs> Malachi, how do the approaches to balance and game fairness differ between TSR and WotC editions, and what impact does this have on gameplay? Okay, well, uh, WotC, I felt, did balance a different way, if there was any at all. That was in the XP tables. That was a big balancing mm -hmm. factor. Ah, Wizard yeah. was a very powerful class. It was also the took the longest to level up. A it thief, was an investment, yeah. Yeah, a thief. You know, especially, you know, you're a thief in basic where you only have a D4 hit points, but you're leveling up quickly. So you you may not get that big HP die, but you're going to be getting your HP a little bit quicker. What Watsy ended up doing with 4E was it is the gray goo of RPGs. Everything is the same. It was for the for purely for balance. They wanted everything balance against each other to the point where you could have a stat other than dexterity to affect your armor class what yeah wizards i i think used int for our ac it was really weird that you could... i don't want to talk to you anymore you make me have bad days <laughs> yeah yeah some of the stuff in for you was like oh it's for it was all for balance and then it just, it just made everything the same, and still Watsy is there trying to keep that balance. We end up with the gray goo. By having unbalanced things, you get a little bit of that flavor in there. I'll let and you pick. Oh, go ahead. Well, you said fairness, <laughs> and I will say, fairness in a game is more up to the DM than mm -hmm. the rule system. Sure. Um, I would think though that if you compare the two. I was going to say books, that's not right. If you compare Watsy edition versus TSR edition, you'll find out that fairness in the TSR editions is more implicit. Yeah. Where the fairness in the, uh, is much more explicit. Uh, yeah. Your challenge ratings. Yeah, yeah. between challenge ratings, like you're talking about the XP, all this mm -hmm. balance, the, the whole feat synergy and so forth. Yeah. Um, yeah. But can you share an example of a house? And I'll let you pick Watsy or TSR edition, whatever. Uh, uh, an example of a rule or modification you made to one of those editions of the game and why you felt it was necessary. Um, I remember one that I did for a player. Uh, oh, I was running third edition. Uh, she liked the Sohi class from Oriental Adventures, but they didn't want to have the magic. So I swapped it out for like a similar to a monk's uh, Fury of Blows ability. Player was happy. I didn't feel like it broke the game at all. Okay, so in terms of fairness or balance, uh, I, I'd say in, in a fairness aspect, you're fair to the character. You did, yep. didn't break the game and so forth. Mm -hmm. Did that have any meaningful effect on any balance issues of the game? I didn't think so. I do. Would you care if it did? <laughs> Honestly, probably not. <laughs> fair enough. Okay. All right, Bear, you get the qu the last one of this. Uh, I just realized there are three questions in this segment. I didn't know that. Yeah. Uh, uh, how do the approaches to balance and game fairness differ between TSR and WotC editions, and what impact does it have on gameplay? Um, I, I'm going to call people out on their BS a little bit. Uh -oh. Not the panel, but generally the OSR. Um, but first, let me say balance is for wussies. And uh, if you if you require balance, well, you know what? Come on over. I'll hold your hand and help you across the street like a good Boy Scout. Otherwise, life is unbalanced. The game is unbalanced. If you're dumb enough to go in that dragon's lair at level one, well, you get what you deserve. But 
OSR sings the praises of Gary Gygax, as you like to call them, the priors of Gygax <laughs> and, and all that fun stuff. But then they crap all over this book and say, it's broken. It's broken. It's broken. Yeah, it's broken. So what? Play the game. You can kill a cavalier and a barbarian and anybody else just as easily as a fighter, a thief, or a cleric. Kill this horse. I don't get the Rock absolute clock. hatred of balance in new D D, the praise of unbalance in OSR, except when the Unearth Arcana is involved, and then that's the devil's handbook. It makes no sense. It's that's absolutely fair. silly. Gygax wrote it. It's Gygax's stupid stuff. You all go on about how Gygax is the you know, Gygax this and Gygax that. Well, that's Gygax, 100 percent Gygax. Mm -hmm. And I freaking love it. If I'm playing AD and D and you say no on Earth Arcana, I'm not playing at your table. That's just the way it's gonna be. So that's what I think about all that. Sir. Okay. Well, same same question that I gave them, and I'll let you pick the version that you want. Um, by the way, the answer can't be, oh, I don't do D&D. &D. You have to stick to D&D because that's what the topic's about. Uh, can you share an example of house rule or modification you made to either a TSR or watch a game and why you felt it was necessary? I, first of all, feel very targeted by yes. that uh, rule, just so we know. <laughs> all right. Um, so active defense. Uh, active defense, I think, is one of the best rules you can have in a game. Mm -hmm. And for those who don't know what active defense is, it's when basically instead of having a flat AC, the monster attacks, gives a number, the player then rolls their D20 plus their initiative modifier and tries to match or beat the attack that was coming against them. What this does for the game is it keeps the players involved at every step of combat. They're always rolling dice. Everything is from their point of view. It's from mm -hmm. them, not you sitting back going, well, Goblin got a 20, you're dead. No, you take their attack value, you add 10 to it. Some say add 11, take your pick. So because in all the D&Ds after from Watsi, this is a Watsi rule because you need a sending AC for this to be a part of it. Uh, you'll see every monster has a number beside their attack. And it'll be 8 or 7 or 12. Add 10 to that, that's the attack. The players then defend by rolling a D20 plus their initiative modifier and anything else they get to avoid being attacked keeps the focus on the players, keeps them engaged. They're not doing this while you're rolling dice. In my opinion, DM should never roll dice, ever. All right, the Bear's kicked off the show. The Have a nice oh, day, Bear. Uh, as the good, as, as good will it lasted. But <laughs> I, I, okay, <laughs> bye, Harmony. It was nice meeting you, Malachi. <laughs> nice meeting China, you. Fire. Bye. Yep. <laughs> he, he just needs to go play Dungeon World. That's all it is. So... <laughs> what? I'm just saying. You said don't, game master doesn't roll dice. Dungeon work comes. Right, Harmony, you said that you actually Boring. thought it was something that you yeah. wanted. To, to... <laughs> so, um, first of all, on the balance thing, I um, actually I, I was thinking of the question as like balance of players versus with other players, but um, not players versus the world. But I think Bear has a very good point on that. That it should simulate an actual world and. If, yeah, you have to play by the rule of FAFO sometimes because, I mean, if um, not everything is going to scale to your level, just because you are uh, low power doesn't mean that there's definitely going to be low level kobolds in the cave, which, by the way, kobolds are deadly anyway. So mm -hmm. uh, good luck, even if you are, if there are kobolds. But anyway, um, a house rule that I like to use that I've used for years that I, I use in 5e and uh, it has worked very, very well for me as I find 5e to be not very deadly at all. And I like to kill people. So <laughs> I am um, characters, I, not, give, not players, right? <laughs> I give people a, um, a, a devil's bargain, so to speak at level one, uh, which is I tell them, look, a, uh, a hag visits you in your dreams and she gives you a choice. You may give up your longevity for power if you choose. I give them a choice to forego death saves and just die at zero. But if they take it, they can just get a feed at level one. That's how I fill up. That's how I fill up my graveyard. I've killed lots of people with that bargain. It's so worth it. Interesting. <laughs> A secret has been spilled, folks. Maybe you should try that at your table. Go ahead, Barry. We're, we're in the open section now, Barry. Anyway. Okay, cool. 
Five uh, E is deadly as hell. I've completely total party killed the 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 goddamn yeah. mines of Fandelver opens up with a <laughs> goblin <laughs> ambush. Where if you mm -hmm. actually use the goblins properly, they're dropping those first level characters into make a new character time. Yeah. Yes, Five yeah. E is deadly at level one. Yes, it's insanely and deadly. I, I heard about a DM who has killed more players in Five E than Basic. I can't say that. But I remember another thing about balance in the TSR editions. You had attribute requirements for classes. Mm -hmm. You wanted all mm -hmm. the powers of the Paladin, you better roll that 17 charisma. Yeah. You know how many people hand wave that? <laughs> 4d6 rep lowest. No. Helps a little bit. 5d6, get rid of highest and lowest. I like Belkers, baby. Um, <laughs> anyway. Wow. Uh, where was, oh, first of all, so I don't forget, this is for Lord Mateus. Thank you very much for the $50 super chat. This is, I think, whiskey? No, it's Southern Comfort. Is there Again. bleach in it? Did she bleach it? <laughs> That's why I was sniffing twice. <laughs> nope. Yeah, No bleach in it this time, I don't think. All right. So thank you, Lord. I, I keep saying his name wrong. Lord Mattias. Uh, for the fifty dollars, uh, he says Lord Mattias on when he's on the show. So yeah. Okay. Is this like a Malak a Malaki thing or <laughs> Malaki thing? All right. Yeah, I kind of like the way a T-shirt says it, Malak Malaki. Let's um, we're only halfway done with the show, and we got to get moving. So let's get yeah. through these chats and let's get on to the next segment. Let's um, go. Uh, let's see. Truffle says, so it's not enough to just say Earth Dawn anymore. <laughs> no, it is not. You now have to pay $50 also. People are trying to kill me with all the Earth Dawn comments in the past. Um, Gunther the Mad for $5 says, everyone remember to hit the like button. The channel is growing, but every little bit helps. That is 100% true. Uh, we're back on track. Uh, unlike last week where I don't know where everybody went. Maybe it's because the football was on or something, but we're back on track today with viewers. I appreciate every single one of you being here. I don't have the time to talk about every chat that comes in here, but I, I am reading them all. And you guys on both the Rumble side and the YouTube side are great. Thank you very much. Law Dog says, some realism in RPGs is necessary. Balance destroys the suspension of disbelief that is needed for an RPG, in my opinion. I think he's... You know, kind of, kind of like when Harmony earlier said about the... Uh, um, uh, oh my god. <laughs> I lost it. The, the, the idea that uh, having limitations breeds creativity. Uh, having a character class, you know, as Barry was saying, you know, the Cavalier, that is inherently stronger than some other ones. That doesn't lead towards because because what what that is is that's my player saying well he can do more damage than me and he's gonna laugh at me in school. That's all that really comes down to ninety percent of the time is that a good game master. Guess what? He's gonna focus on the guy with the horse because he's scarier. Why are you always targeting me? Well, you're the one that picked the overpowered class, and people recognize that when they see some dude on a horse and a lance that's coming after you. That could hurt, you know. Uh, uh, where you know a little. Uh, was a Mortimer Snurd over here trying to barely lift the one-handed sword as he's like falling over with it. <laughs> yes, Bear, go ahead. You you, you want to, you know, handle that overpowered cavalier? Go in a dungeon. Yeah. Can't bring mm -hmm. the horse. Yeah. That's like well, uh, well, then this is a dumb adventure. You didn't think about me. Okay, well, you're the one who wanted to play a centaur, Max. I mean, if it's an open <laughs> world, it's their choice to go in a dungeon. Boom! Too bad. Can't bring your dog, horse, whatever. <laughs> your dog. <laughs> yeah. If I'm a gnome cavalier, Ooh. there you go. <laughs> uh, I'm a goblin wolf rider. All right. Uh, I, sorry, I've sorry. started to refer to all player pets as dogs. So. <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> I've started referring to them as you keep track of that shit. Mm -hmm. yeah. that, that's where I'm at with it. Pet classes, man, meant for MMOs. All right, I have a bunch of other comments that I want to say here, but we have to move on. So the next segment is going to be on adventure modules and campaign settings. And I'm doing things a little out of order here, but that's just too bad. Uh, the charity we support is the Wounded Warrior Project. Here, let me put that up. Boom, there we go. Charity we support is the Wounded Warrior Project, a national 
nonpartisan organization whose mission is to honor and empower wounded warriors. Please refer to the video's description for the link to where you can make your hopefully tax-deductible donation. And we have not been doing well with the charity this year. This is of the four years that I've been doing this. This is by far the worst year for donations. So we could really, really, really use some donations for the Wounded Warrior Project. I've talked to many people who have been helped by it. Um, I know there's some skeptics out there, but still, I, I've literally talked to people, went to the gun range, and some guy was talking his praise. Didn't even know the dude talk about the Wounded Warrior Project. So, uh, please, if you've got, if you have the money, it would be awesome if you could donate to the Wounded Warrior Project. And of course, if you enjoy this discussion, please like this video, subscribe to all of the panelists' channels, which you can find in the description.